Lord, this is a great moment. I've been looking forward to it, being with these friends who I love, but more importantly, you love, and your Holy Spirit uh, has access to their hearts, and you want to teach us all today. And so we're looking forward to what you're going to say to us and how we're going to have the chance to respond and become more like you. It's an exciting, wonderful moment, and we are here ready for you. So use this time for your good and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you are with us and you would like to follow along in a Bible, we have Bibles for you, and our ushers are standing up right now, um, and they're going to offer you a Bible. If you'd like one, just raise your hand, and they will give you one. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew 6, so if you're on a mobile device or in your own Bible, you can certainly use those too. And as we like to say every week, um, there's always new people here, and if you would like to take one of these home, uh, it's our gift to you, and we'd love for you to take it. So we began um, this series by setting this Sermon on the Mount. That's what we're in, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And we set it in a context. And the context was, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still a little gravelly here. The context was Jesus was talking about something that he talked about more than anything else in his ministry. And I want to see how many of you remember what that was. What is, it that, what is the thing that Jesus talks about more than 100 times in the Gospels? Yeah, the kingdom of God. If you weren't here, it's the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the realm where things are done God's way. Let's say that phrase, where things are done God's way. That's the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is all about this kingdom of God. And uh, I have to tell you that as I've been thinking about this gospel of the kingdom and the kingdom of God, it's really had a fresh impact on my walk with God in a couple of distinct ways. First of all, in my behavior. Because I keep asking myself when I have the chance to think about what I'm going to do, I ask myself, is this something, and I use the phrase, that a kingdom guy would do? You know, a person who is in the kingdom, is this something that a kingdom person would do? And uh, if the answer is no, you know, then I try not to do it, right? You know, if it's a thing that a kingdom person wouldn't do. And so the world, can we agree, offers a lot of opportunities to do things that kingdom people wouldn't do. Amen. All right, and so I have to ask myself, am I going to click on that? Maybe it's violent-oriented or illicit-oriented or, you know, it, it's not a good thought. Am I going to click on that? And I go, am, am I going to say that unkind word? Well, if a kingdom guy doesn't say it, then I think, I'm not going to say that. And God offers us a lot of ways to do things his way. So he says, you have the chance to bless someone. Well, a kingdom person would do that, so I think, I want to do that. And uh, am I being as generous a person as a kingdom person would be? Now, I had a <clears throat> kind of a unique opportunity this past weekend. We were away, and uh, we went on a trip, um, just the four of the Bolton family, my wife, myself, and my two daughters. And uh, the thing that was missing, um, and by the way, welcome to everybody's on YouTube, especially my sons-in-law, um, <clears throat> so I better be careful what I say. Um, so uh, anyway, it was just the four of us, and we hadn't done that since my first daughter got married almost 11 years ago. And so we were going through the weekend, and we were having some fun. We were doing some great things. But about um, toward the end of the trip, I noticed that there was something in myself that I didn't like, and that was that I was being a bit selfish and ungenerous. Um, can any dads relate to that sometimes with your family? You know, you're just feeling a little bit selfish. Maybe you're a little tapped out. And when I caught myself doing it, I thought, Mark, you haven't been with just your daughters and your wife in 11 years, and it may be another 11 years before this happens. Don't miss this opportunity to love and be generous and kind. So I, on Monday morning, I said, hey, guys, I think I've been a little ungenerous and a little selfish, and I would just like to ask you to forgive me, and I want to just kind of you know, open the floodgates and that, that I'm not going to hold anything back. I just want to love you this next uh, two hours that are left in our weekend. No. <laughs> <clears throat> and... I have to tell you <clears throat> that when I did that, um, it really kind of changed the tone, and it capped off our weekend in a way that was really, especially, we had a good weekend, but it was especially intimate, because what I had done, and, and what is that called when you do that? Does anybody remember from the gospel what it's called when you do what I just did? Who said that? Yeah, yeah, it's repenting, right? I repented of something I was doing that wasn't kingdom-oriented. I wasn't acting like a kingdom guy, and it just kind of brought us all together. It was pretty remarkable. Now, <clears throat> the second way that I've been impacted by this Jesus kingdom message is in the way that I've been sharing the gospel. And I had the opportunity, as I do from time to time, I had a gentleman come into my office last week, and we were talking about some things. He had some things on his mind, and uh, he wanted to share about those. But I said, I want to hear that. And then I responded to what he was saying. But I said, I, I have a message for you. 
And I want to tell you this thing. It's, it's the kingdom gospel. And I'm going to put up this framework because this was the framework of the conversation that I told you I would use in week one of this series five weeks ago, and I used it with him. So the first thing I said is, and I won't use his name, but I said, are you doing the will of God? And you know what he said? He said, no. I mean, just like that. He said, no. No, I'm not doing the will of God. And I said, well, Jesus came, and he said, I am bringing a kingdom, and this kingdom is where things work God's way. And he wants you in it. He wants you in that kingdom. He wants you to be a part of that kingdom. And you know what that guy did at that point? The tears started to come down his cheeks. Because it is such an enormous compliment to think that God wants you as part of his kingdom, as part of his kingdom agents in the world. Do you know that about you? God wants you to be a kingdom agent bringing his love into the world. Do you know that about you? That's his plan for you. He says, get into my kingdom and be part of this great contagion of love in the world. I want you in it. And so the tears began to come. And I said, but since you said you're not doing the will of God, and of course anybody would say that, you have to change that. And that's actually what the Bible calls repenting. You have to turn from that, stop doing things your way, and start doing things God's way. And because you have that record of doing those things that way, the next thing you have to do to get into the kingdom is you have to repent and believe. I said repent, now you're going to have to believe the gospel. And the gospel is that Jesus paid for all that stuff you did that was outside the will of God. And then he rose from the dead to give you the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you to live a new kind of life. And you can do that, and God wants to do that. And then there's one last thing. When you walk out of my office, I'm going to tell you, with everything that you're facing, I want you to just do one more thing, and that is follow Jesus in everything you do. And he talked about some things that he was facing. He said, what about this? What about that? I won't use the details. And I said, I can't give you all the answers, but I can give you the framework that will give you all the answers. And that is, whatever it is you're doing, just ask the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And it was like, that's all you have to know. Just go out and follow Jesus. So I have just found this really transformational. And so what we're going to see today is that... Uh, this Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' way of saying, here's what life is like in the kingdom. <clears throat> here's what my kingdom guys and kingdom women are like. Here's what kingdom families are like. Like I told you that description of my family. When I was done with the weekend, I thought, that's the way a kingdom family should live. You know, you make mistakes, you repent, you believe that God forgives you, and then, you know, you walk with Jesus, you follow Jesus, and things kind of go pretty well. And so Jesus is saying, I want to show you how kingdom people live. And in this particular part of the message, what he's doing is saying, I want to show you how you enact your religious activities in a way that kingdom people do. So he's going to talk about three religious activities, which are giving, praying, and fasting. And he's going to tell us how kingdom people do those things. You ready for that? Yeah. All right, good. Well, let's read the scripture. We're going to turn to Matthew 6, 1 through 16, 16 through 18. Turn to it in your Bibles, get it on your mobile devices. Let's stand for God's word, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to wet my whistle, see if that helps a little bit. <laughs> okay, beginning with Matthew 6, <clears throat> verse 1. Jesus says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to, de to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, first category, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Verse 3. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Verse 5. Second category. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. <clears throat> truly I tell you they have received their reward in full but when you pray go into your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you third category fasting when you fast do not look somber as the hypocrites do for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting truly I tell you they've got their reward in full right there but when you fast Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who's seen, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is God's word. Please be seated. Now, let me ask you a question. You listed that. You looked at it. You might have been reading it. There's two audiences in there. What are the two audiences? Because that's what we're talking about here. What are the two audiences that Jesus says we can play to? What is number one? People, right? People. What's number two? 
God. And so this is the phrases he used. Now, um, you know, it used to be translated men, but the uh, new scriptures have kind of um, opened that up. Others is what it says in the NIV. But the word in Greek is actually anthropoise, which is a generic enough term that it can mean people of any kind, of course, of either gender. So that's the first audience, right? Is other people, men, women, those who are watching. That's the first audience. And the second one is your father. Now, it's interesting how he describes that, who observes what is done in secret. And that phrase in secret is the Greek phrase encrypto. Now, you know, you might say, well, that, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, sure you are. You know the word crypt, right? What is a crypt? It's a room that you hide things in, right? You know, tales of the crypt, you know, it's that hidden place. And more important, you, you know, the more obvious, you might say to yourself, well, I don't know the word encrypto. Of course you do. How many of you know the word encryption, right? And what is encryption? Who's in IT? Someone raise their hand. Okay, BJ, what's encryption, buddy? It is hiding or obscuring data. So they'll say, you may submit this payment because it's what? Encrypted. It is made to be secret so someone seeing it would not know what it is. And Jesus is saying, your religious actions should be found in a crypt. He's saying, when you do religious actions, you should encrypt them. You should put them in secret places so that everybody can't see them. And what he knows is that, friends, that goes against every natural tendency you and I have because we love people to see our religious actions, don't we? Now, of course, the context for this is Jesus is talking with a group of religious people. And these religious people in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, they loved to do their religious actions. And how did they love it? Did they want to play for God or for the people? Come on, talk to me. For the people. That's exactly right, Duke. They want to do it for the people. Now, rather than telling you the story where Jesus portrayed this, he told a parable that's quite familiar. It's called the parable of the Pharisee. Those are the ones who like to do it for people. And the tax collector. I'm going to show you a segment from one of the uh, portrayals of the life of Jesus, three minutes long. And uh, watch Jesus tell yeah, this parable. Tax. All taxes must be paid in full! We're all Jews. How can they live with themselves? Our own people working for Rome. These people make me sick. Collaborators. Let's move on. A stinking vermin. You should keep your distance from him. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other one. tax collector. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. But the tax collector didn't even look up to heaven. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God bless the tax collector. Not the Pharisee. Anyone who praises himself for be humbled. And anyone who humbles himself will be praised. Matthew, come. Now 
he even calls the sinners to follow him. I want you to uh, look more closely at what Jesus said about the Pharisee in this parable. Put that verse up. Let's read this together. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Interesting, two of the categories are covered, aren't they? Fasting and giving. Now, keep that up there. Do you see what this man's perverted and broken religion has led him to? You know what he thinks. He thinks he's better. But the phrase is interesting, because you know what he says is, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Hey, religious friends, you ever do that? Come on. We do that, don't we? I had the occasion to travel yesterday out uh, west a ways, and uh, I stopped for lunch. I was alone, and uh, I stopped at a, um, actually a place I wanted to stop out in Cleveland called The Melt, you know, for a good grilled cheese. If you've ever been there, it's a great place to go. And uh, the particular place I went uh, in Cleveland Heights was uh, completely dead. There was nobody there. So I sat at the bar, and uh, the guy that served me couldn't have looked any more different than me. You know, it wasn't possible that someone could look more different than me, okay? He looked like Rip Van Winkle with tattoos. You know, the long, ta- the long, yeah, long tattoo coming, <laughs> the long beard, you know, tattoos on the head. Um, And then the waitress had blue hair, and every part of her body that I could observe was uh, pierced. And, uh, you know, since I was thinking about this passage, you know what I thought to myself? I thought, these people are no different than me. You know, the religious Pharisee in me would have said, I'm not like these people. But I thought, they're just like me. They have dreams just like me. They... You know, they contribute, you know, in ways just like me. And so, uh, you know, I actually struck up a great conversation with them. And by the time I left, I felt, you know, I was alone. I wasn't doing anything. So I sat around and got drunk for the rest of the day. (laughs) We got real close. (laughs) Right, yeah, right. But when I left, I felt like I had come into a relationship of cordiality and love with these people because I didn't say, boy, are they different than me. And religious people, we do that all the time. Oh, I'm glad I'm not like them. And that's at the height of Phariseeism and religious arrogance. Now, I'm a pastor, right? And so um, as a pastor these days, you know, you can watch all the pastors falling around you in these big churches, and you could say, boy, am I glad I'm not like them. That's what religious pastors can do. And I, I always remind myself, Lord, how do I know that if I hadn't had that kind of fame and notoriety and bigness that I wouldn't have fallen in the same thing, you know, I'm, but the natural thing to say is, I'm glad I'm not like them. And Jesus is always saying, don't do that. Don't look at people that way. He's always saying, look at people with humility. You know, great phrase that people have been saying for years is, there but for the grace of God go I. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 14. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited. Then the host who invited both you, both of you, will come and tell you, give this man your seat. In other words, get out of that good seat. You don't belong there. And in humiliation, you will have to take the last place. <clears throat> but when you are invited, go and sit in the last place, the least desirable place, so that your host may come to you and say, hey, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in front of everyone at the table with you. And here's the key phrase in verse 11 of Luke 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you see how countercultural Jesus is? Can you tell me, do, has there ever been a time of more self-exaltation than this time that we live in, friends? I mean, come on, what's social media? 80% of it's self-exaltation, isn't it? Let's return to our passage. We're in Luke, uh, uh, Matthew 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, we're going to talk about giving now. When you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. And commentators disagree. They, they don't think that necessarily they, they were doing that. Jesus was kind of using hyperbole to say, you know, they announce it, but not with trumpets. Uh, <clears throat> truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Verse 3. 
But when you give the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving may be in secret, so that you have encrypted good works. You see that? Then your father who sees what has been encrypted, done in secret, and crypto, will reward you. Now, you know, sometimes I get the advantage, um, and it's really kind of a fun thing, of seeing the secret things you do as a church, okay? The secret things you do. Um, I learned of a family recently who has been for years mentoring and caring for some inner city children who live in a very rough neighborhood. And they were telling me a couple weeks ago, and I'm not going to identify who they are. They wouldn't want me to tell you. Um, they picked up these now teenage boys, and when they got into their van, I think it was, or their SUV, the two boys immediately fell asleep, middle of the day. And they said, you know, they kind of wondered what that was about. And when the boys woke up later, they said, what, you know, why were you so tired? They said, well, our home and our neighborhood is so violent and so frightening that when we got in your car, we felt safe, and that's why we fell asleep. Nobody knows what these people are doing. Nobody knows about that. I know about a couple who support children, you know, kind of like many of us do through, like, um, World Vision and that kind of thing. And when the organization was ready to graduate those kids from high school, they said, hey, is there any way you'd support this child for their college education? They said, yeah. And then they called and said, well, there's another one. Say, yeah, and then another one. And they've been supporting these kids through this organization to put them through college. Nobody knows about it. Nobody knows who they are. I went to visit a young woman um, in Cleveland at the ICU, um, when we've been talking about and praying for in our church uh, a couple Saturdays ago. And uh, when I got there, one of our families, and he is a, a hospitalist doctor, and so he and his wife were there visiting, and he, it was such perfect timing because the intensivist from Cleveland Clinic was there, and this hospitalist was able to interpret all the very medical kind of language that was going forth, and I was able to observe this, and this family was out there caring for them. And when I was leaving at the elevator, there was another one of you coming out of the elevator, and then the next day in church, another family says, well, we're going out today, driving two hours out just to care for this family whose daughter was in a coma. Just love that nobody knows about. I was in the throes of preparing my message on Thursday, and it was kind of one of those weeks where it's grinding and uh, you know, not coming along, and Andrea in the office left a card. It was obviously a card. It had that blue envelope on my desk. I said, where'd, where'd that come from? You see, and I know you don't clean out your mailbox all the time, so I put it on your desk. And so I opened it up, and it was a note from someone who wanted to thank me for some words that I'd said that I might have forgotten about that made a tremendous difference in her life. And it just, you know, put the wind in my sails. I was like, Lord, what timing you have. And it was just a beautiful gift, right? So gifts don't always come in the way of money, do they? I mean, there's all kinds of ways we give. And that's what Jesus is saying kingdom people do. They're giving their money. They're giving their time. They're giving their encouragement. They're giving their love, not looking for anything back and not looking for anybody to notice except God, who, when we encrypt them, says, I'm going to give you a reward for it. Now, Let's uh, take a look at what Paul said about Jesus' words on this subject. This is Acts 10. In everything I did, Paul says, I showed you by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself who said, it is more blessed to give than receive. So kingdom people are givers. And Jesus said, when we give, when we encrypt our giving, I'm going to keep using that phrase, when we encrypt our giving, God makes a promise. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I know it's coming. That's the only part I remember. Your father, who knows what is, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. That was the whole thing. Now, we're going to see this phrase three times, you know, um, with regard to secret giving, secret praying, and secret fasting. And we shouldn't um, pass over it too quickly because it holds a great promise. Because I want to tell you, I think we're under a spell in our culture. And the spell is that we think our rewards are going to come from the material world. You know that? We think that the rewards in the life are going to come from the material world. And God thinks different. He says, that's not where your rewards are going to come from. Your rewards are going to come from me and serving me. And let me just portray it this way. Um, give me 100 or, you know, this would be a pretty nice meal, but give me $500 and I can have a pretty nice meal, right? Really nice meal. Give me $5,000 and I can probably buy a nice vacation. Give me uh, $50,000, I can probably buy a pretty nice car. And you give me $500,000 and I could buy a pretty nice house. Now, if those things brought happiness, why is it that all kinds of people in our community are living in half-million-dollar houses who are taking $50,000 vacations, or, um, fi yeah, that would be a really nice vacation. <laughs> Driving $50,000 cars with $5,000 vacations and $500 dinners, and their relationships are broken, and they're miserable. So you tell me that money can make you happy, and Jesus said it's different. I told you that the weekend uh, I had away with my wife and two daughters was uh, really special. But, you know, we did fun things. We ate in neat restaurants. We did all those kind of things. But you know what uh, I remember? I remember the moments when I had the chance just to put my 
arm around either daughter or hold the hand of my wife and just say, boy, it's just so great to be with you. And on Thursday this week, and I pulled it up as I was sitting there, I got a text from this daughter sitting right here and said, Dad, it was just such a great weekend of you loving me, loving on me, and I just want to tell you all the great memories I have from that. You see, friends, that's what kingdom people live like. That's the way of the kingdom. But we're all under the spell that things are the reward. You hear me? We're all under a spell that things are the, the reward. And God says, no, I'm the reward. No, I'm the rewarder. No, when you live well in the kingdom, love is the reward. You know that? Love is the reward, people, not things. And he says, come into my kingdom and stop trying to satisfy yourself on sawdust and live in this world of love and this world of giving and this world of serving, and you're going to have the joy I meant you to have. And even your troubles, your broken relationships, your losses, your weakness, your terrible memories, I can even turn those into good for my glory. Amen? It's true. It's true. You know, we say we're believers, don't we? But we don't take God at his word in this, friends, because we've become so worldly that we have lost our ability to fall in love with the right things. Do you hear that? we become so worldly that we've lost our ability to fall in love with the right things. That's true for me and it's true for you. And are we going to believe Jesus? Are we going to take him at his word today or aren't we? Let's take him at his word. So Jesus says, when you give, keep it secret as much as you can, and I will reward you. You trust me in this. Now, let's go back to our passage now and look at, pa at prayer. Um, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Now, you probably know what a hypocrite is. It's an actor. It's someone who puts on a face. And when they're acting in the you know, Areopagus or when they're acting in Broadway, we accept it. But Jesus is saying, you don't act when you do your righteous deeds. You probably remember what we uh, saw John Stott say in week one of this. He said, there is no single paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount in which the contrast between the Christian and non-Christian standards is not drawn. A Christian's character was to be completely distinct by that admired by the world. So resist all temptation to make your praying public or to talk about it because God says it's between you and me and then I can reward you when your prayer is encrypted. Now, you know, I'm a little bit different than you. I like the Adam's joke, you know, I get paid to be good. You guys are good for nothing. Um, that, that's a good one. But I, I bet this never happens to you. Do you get asked to pray in public that much? Probably not that much. That, get, that happens to me all the time because I'm a pastor. It's like you're a professional prayer. They expect great things out of you. And then what, what happens is, it's funny because maybe you're at a banquet thing. This happens all the time. Maybe you're with friends and, and you go up and you pray and then you sit down and people say, good job. They pat you on the back. Now, that's nice. I, I, it's better when they say, boy, that was terrible. You know, that was an awful prayer. But anyway, that happens to pastors. So I was thinking about it. Maybe if we were more honest, we would pray like this when we get into those situations. I'm going to just try this on you. You can tell me if you think I should use it at my next wedding. God, I have no business being here in front of these people, leading them in prayer. You know my heart. You know how selfish it is. And you know how I love people's applause. If these people could see into my heart, they wouldn't want me to lead them in prayer. They probably wouldn't want me to lead them in anything. But they've asked me here, so here goes. God bless this couple and our food. Amen. <laughs> now let's talk about this last category of fasting because Jesus assumes we're going to fast. And uh, there, there's two reasons why we fast in the spiritual world. I mean, I was talking to someone earlier who does like a five-day fast periodically for uh, health reasons. That, that's different. When we fast for spiritual reasons, we're doing one of two things. One, we're strengthening our no muscle. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to say no to, let's say, a cookie or, you know, to food? I, I notice that all the time, right? And so fasting is a way of saying to your body, I can say no to you, and you sometimes have to obey that. Because we're, you know, God wants us to be able to say no to lust or to greed or to uh, overeating, you know, those kind of things. So he says, every once in a while, you should try just telling your body, I'm the boss. And you do that by fasting. The other reason we fast is because we might have something special we're praying about, and we say to God, God, I'm so serious about this that I'm going to miss my meals today. I'm going to pray for this person. And that's the other reason we fast. So those are the reasons we fast. And when we fast, Jesus says, reduce or, um, remove all temptation. Do not give in to telling people about it. Now, I want to tell you about when I fast. I actually found that a little challenging, this message, because you know, I can't use my example. So uh, there you go. Um, I want to close by showing you the difference in this uh, 
in this passage between religion done the world's way and done God's way. Take a look. So, <clears throat> verse 1, it's in front of others to be seen by them. Verse 2, it's to be honored by others. It's to be seen by others. Verse 15, it's to show others they are fasting. And then here's the way we're supposed to be doing. Our giving should be encrypted. Your Father who sees what is done encrypted in prayer will reward you, and your Father who sees what's done encrypted in fasting will reward you. Um, so it's all about those secrets. It's about what we're going to keep secret. What are you going to keep secret? What are you going to keep secret? So I had an interesting experience a couple summers ago. It was summers ago. It was the summer of 2018, and my wife and I uh, had always thought it would be fun to go to that part of the Bahamas. Um, I don't know if you know of this, but you can take these excursions down in the Exumas to Thunderball Grotto. Those of you who are Bond fans, um, and you swim under the rocks, and you're in this grotto where Sean Connery was in Thunderball. Loved, always loved Sean Connery and Bond, so that was the highlight of my trip. Gina said, I want to go, and I said, if we go to Thunderball Grotto, I'm in. And um, on the same trip, same excursion, they take you to that pig island where the pigs swim out to the boat and you feed them. And that's kind of cool. Yeah, you see that on HGTV. It's like, I want to do this. I should show you the pictures, but I didn't bring those up. And then there's an iguana island. Then they serve you lunch and, you know, on one of the little islands. So it was super fun, super fun, just a couple days. Well, we were sitting in our hotel. It was just two nights stay, and we were getting ready to catch our flight back uh, over to Florida. And uh, I was sitting there having lunch. And you know how your phone pings you when you get an email, and you just see the header on it? You, know, you just see the first line of, you know, like the title. And in the title was my password. You know, the password, it was a little bit of an older password I used, but it was my password, which I'm not going to say to you so that you can't uh, get into all my things. And uh, so I thought, oh, what's my password doing here? And then I said, let me, get your, let me get right to the point. I have video of you on, we, we, I got into your computer and hacked it, and so I know that you've been going to adult sites. And not only that, but then I hacked your camera, and I have a video of you watching those adult sites. And I'm going to distribute that because I also was able to get into all your contacts and your Facebook, and I'm going to send the video, the split screen of you um, interacting with those and that pornography uh, to 11 of your best friends. Unless you send me $1,300 in Bitcoin. So let's just get this done. You've got 24 hours. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I talked to a guy in the earlier service. He had the same email. And... Uh, you know, you're sitting there, you're getting ready to fly back, and, you know, you've had a nice time. It's pretty unnerving, right? Pretty unnerving, because, you know, you're being extorted. But there was one thing that kind of didn't bother me about it. <laughs> I don't go to adult sites. <laughs> so I was like, well, I know this is fake, because uh, that hasn't happened. And so what did I do? I sent it to one of our elders. <laughs> you can tell I wasn't embarrassed, because, like, you sent it to your elders in your church. It's like, I wasn't worried about it, so I sent it to this guy right here. Right, BJ? You get this email. I said, hey, BJ, look into this for me. And you said, okay, I looked into it. Apparently, they, you know, bots send it out to thousands of people for the few who say, oh, I better do this. And they send out $1,300 in Bitcoin. You know what God's saying in this passage? He's saying, I want to put away all your shameful secrets, and I want to give you a new set of secrets. You hear me? He says, I want to erase all your shameful secrets. I have the gospel for you. I'm going to erase your shameful secrets. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a new set of secrets. And you know what those secrets are? Hey, don't tell anyone. I have this special place I go to pray. It's my secret. Once a year I fast on this particular day just to honor God, but nobody knows the secret. I give, I tithe, I have this family I support. Nobody knows it's my secret. Friends, that's what kingdom people are. We ch that's what kingdom people are. That's exactly right. Because we are people who've traded in those shameful secrets and they've been erased by the power of the gospel. And we now have secrets and that is that we follow God and we love God and we worship God and nobody knows about it. Because we don't want them to know because we say, I'm living for the reward of one. I'm living for the audience of one. Is that the kind of person you want to be? That's the kind of person I want to be. Amen? All right, let's pray together. You might imagine how I'm going to pray here. God, I have no business being here in front of these people leading them in prayer. Because you know my heart, you know how selfish it is and how I love the applause of people. If these wonderful people could see into my heart, they wouldn't want me to lead them in prayer. They wouldn't want me to lead them in anything. They'd see those dark recesses, God, and they'd say, wow. But as a pastor, it's part of my role, so here I am. God, when we look at the messiest people in the world, or those who just look messy to us, we know that we're just like them. They're just like us. 
And where we may be different, where we may have hope, where we may be making different choices, it's only because of you. It's only because of you. So God, have mercy on us sinners. Your grace is enough. A great song. Your grace is enough to forgive anything. There's people in here today who think, no, you couldn't forgive me. Oh, no, no, no. Not what I went through. Not what I did. What, not what I've been a part of. And I say to that person, don't call God a liar and do not limit the grace of Jesus Christ because he died for all that sin. Don't come to him with that lack of faith to say, God, amazing grace, how sweet a sound that saved a wretch like me and the wretch next to me and the wretch is to fill this room. So thank you for showing us that when we practice our faith without seeking people's applause, we actually somehow have yours. That means so much more to us. What a day it's going to be when you put our, your arm around us and say, well done, you faithful servant. I heard you in your prayer closet. I saw you when you fasted. I loved it when you took care of the poor and when you were generous. And so God, by your spirit's power, may we live in constant awareness of the audience of one. May we be kingdom guys and kingdom women and kingdom people and kingdom families. God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come in our life, in our church, in our time, in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.